Good evening, it's 7.15pm on Monday the 11th of March and this is the 33rd of 53 consecutive five mile walks from the Grespin Memorial Wheel to the Miners Rescue and back again. And tonight's walk is uh, particularly exciting because at the halfway point I'm uh, hooking up with Jay, the Eastside Hawk, big Wrexham fan who's over at the moment from New York. Met him briefly on Saturday. Lovely, lovely guy. Does a tremendous amount from the other side of the Atlantic for charities in Wrexham. And I'm really looking forward to meeting him a little bit more length in about 45 minutes time. Over the past few walks, we've been looking at accountability with specific attention on the miners themselves, the unions and the mine manager, William Bonzo. And of course, looking down on all these from above and overseeing the structural conditions of industrial Britain, elected officials in Westminster. That overriding presence lingers this evening as we turn our attention to the mines inspectorate who had the responsibility of overseeing safety in all of Britain's mines. The Inspectorate was born out of the emerging social conscience of the mid-1800s, which would ultimately shape the welfare state some 100 years later, following the publication of the Beveridge Report. The Times would no longer tolerate boys as young as five years old working in mines, and by 1843, it was illegal to employ boys below the age of 10 and girls of women of any age. Parliament would need to monitor the laws they introduced, but of course, in the interest of production, in the interest of empire, and in the interest of the most ruthless brand of capitalism, they would seek to do this without overly restricting the freedom of entrepreneurs to make money. And so they established the lightest of lightweight mines inspectorates, Lord Londonderry, MP and pit owner himself, made his own feelings known about the concept of mine inspection. He'd be delighted to welcome inspectors to his underground workings, on condition they stay there. The inspectorate was so lightweight that the first inspector of mines was the only one. All alone with 2,000 pits to inspect, and with firm expectations that he would not venture below ground. I've led schools through a number of Ofsted inspections and nothing would have made me happier to have left them on the street outside. And so the disasters kept coming and the death toll kept climbing. In the decades leading up to the Gresford disaster, successive governments would increase the numbers of inspectors while simultaneously adding to their workload. In 1864, it was reported that some Welsh pits had not been inspected for 13 years. The overstretched, overworked inspectorate would eventually be allowed to enter mines at no notice on receiving a complaint or invitation to do so, but they could not demand change only advised managers on their findings. They could report a mine for inaction, but not enforce sanction, which made the entire system somewhat futile, especially as the mine owners were reluctant to action change. The great paradox as described by Stanley Williamson was that as the number of inspectors increased, so did the number of accidents. And given that the inspectorate were duty bound to investigate, the business of systematic inspection fell behind. The inspector was largely reactionary and the introduction of a new law to enable inspectors to inspect every section of every mine, at least once every six months, was seriously inhibited. And so the disasters kept coming and the death toll kept climbing. The Chief Inspector overseeing North Wales 
and a number of other regions at the time of the disaster was William Charlton. He had two senior inspectors under him, with only one of them, Thomas Boydell, being attached to Gresford. Boydell had a junior inspector under him, one Percy Dominey, who would become Stafford Cripps's next victim at the inquiry, leading towards what was described as an embarrassing performance. Under gentle questioning from his own superior, William Charlton, Dominey would point an idyllic inspection landscape. Few safety issues were seemingly impacting Gresford, by the odd report of passing gas. And where issues arose, such as the shot firing, Bonzel was said to be receptive of Dominey's recommendations. Happy days. However, by the time Cripps had finished with Dominey, it was revealed that there were key areas of the mine he'd never entered. A failure to uncover illegal shift patterns, key ventilation problems that went unaddressed, air measurements and shot firing records that had remained undread, and reports of gas ignored. Dominey's superior, Bradell and his boss, Charlton himself, also faced questioning, and they too were exposed for not carrying out their full responsibilities in relation to Gresford, which to all intents and purposes, was operating safely and within the law. The system of inspection had failed Gresford. Cripps described it as farcical. And when the disaster struck, just a stone throws away from where I am now, it was the latest to be added to the list of mining tragedies and the death toll kept climbing. Sir Henry Walker, lest we forget, was His Majesty's Chief Inspector of Mines and the Commissioner of the Inquiry. We'd seen the potential for a conflict of interest a few walks ago. His summing up of the role of the Inspectorate in the Gresford disaster was brief and on the whole quick to recognise that it was Parliament and not the Inspectorate who would need to reflect on the principles of the inspection system and its seeming inability to prevent mining disasters. He gently wrapped Dominey and his superiors over the knuckles. It was only the masterful Crips who would paint the true picture of how the inspectorate had done next to nothing to protect the safety of the Gresford miners. This walk was dedicated to Colin V. Maggs, Albert Mannion, Thomas A. Manuel, William H. Martin, and Samuel Matthias. Tonight's song is Fast Car by Tracy Chapman.